this forever. Here he comes! Look out! Evil eye, evil eye, look away before you die! Yeah! Ah, watch out! <laughs> Hopkins? Perry! What are you doing on dry land, you old sea snake? As you see, laddie. Nothing more. Huh. When did you put in? Only this very moment, lad. Only this very moment. Say, what happened to the leg, boy? Ah, uh, this. An accident a little more than a month ago. In fact, I've just now left the hospital. Ah, that's unfortunate, laddie. A month, eh? Why so long? Well, there were some... complications. Doctor said I was lucky to keep it at all. Indeed, indeed. Well, that aside, you're looking well, boy. Say, Perry, I'm lucky to have run into you. Lucky? Well, it's like I said, I've just put in, and I haven't had any luck finding lodgings. You wouldn't happen to have an empty cot to let now, would you, laddie? Of course. You see, the trouble is, we won't be paid until she's unloaded. A day or two is all. Not to worry, my friend. There's room. <laughs> fine, son, fine. Well, come along. I'm sure you've got plenty to tell after such a long time. Hi, <laughs> lad. Plenty to tell. Blood curdling. <laughs> <laughs> You're a slippery one, Perry. No doubt about that. The crew mainly played checkers or jack in the barrel. A fine crew, but not thinking men, you see. A Captain Block, though. Now, he's a clever man and a worthy opponent, but we seldom got the chance to play. Let's see now. There. It's your move, laddie. And remember, I've got my eye on you. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Knight takes queen and checkmate. <laughs> the evil eye strikes again. <laughs> uh, is that cheating? Cheating? I don't think so. No rules broken, laddie. No rules broken. <laughs> uh, I suppose not. It's good to see you, Hopkins. A couple of years at sea has done you good. I wish I, I had something to offer you, but there's... Nothing in the house. Well then, maybe you can help ease an old man's burdens, son. Well, what have you got there? Sherry. Sherry? Amontillado, my boy, Amontillado. Amontillado? Then you were at Spain. I, Spain, Portugal, North Africa, and the Mediterranean. Ah, and the senoritas? <laughs> When they saw my eye patch in Tarifa, they all called me Capitan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so tell me, how was your voyage? Smooth sailing? Far from, laddie. Far from. Oh? There are foul winds blowing across the face of the earth, laddie. Foul enough to drive an old barnacle like me onto terra firma. What happened? What didn't? When we first set out, we were just out of Boston Harbor when we came to the aid of the Lady Anne. I read about the Lady Anne in the Post. Terrible tragedy. No survivors. Not a one. We saw some sailors on the rigging, so we went over in the rescue boats. When we got close to her, we could see that the men were dead. Stuck to the ropes by the freezing spray. Good heavens. Then... Three days out of Gibraltar, bound for Algiers, a violent gale came up like Poseidon himself and battered us about. Lost one of the men overboard. Well, we searched and searched for him, but nothing. Then, after dark, I spotted a signal flare off our starboard side. We turned about and headed for her, hoping they had found our man. Spanish ship. But by the time we reached her location, she'd already gone down, 
save for a lifeboat with only four crewmen aboard. Captain went down with the vessel. We managed to get them a rope, and we had them right up against us, fingers almost touching when they saw this eye pulling the lifeline. They let go the line and started rowing back into the storm. We lost them in the waves, superstitious fools. All hands lost. This wine really warms the blood, eh, Perry? Indeed, especially after having it chilled. Yep, they were as good as sea, but they let go the line. That defies instinct, my boy, that's superstition. If a sailor heeded every maritime taboo, he'd never leave the dock for the deck. Well, it's about time I turn in. Long day tomorrow. Thanks for keeping an old man entertained. Good night, Perry. Good night. Stroke of luck meeting up with Hopkins like that. And nice not to be alone. Maybe after all that misery at sea, his luck is changing too. Lady Anne. And those Spaniards drowned in the sea by fairy tales. All hands lost. Incredible. Superstition. <laughs> Best not to believe in such things. there. Nothing I say. All right. I'm all right. Uh, a dream. That's all. Just, just a dream. The wine. <laughs> That's it. Too much wine. Just, just too much wine. Algiers for some time while the repairs were being made. Ever been to the sunnier climes, laddie? I can't say that I have. Ah, oh, fascinating place, fascinating place. Exotic, laddie. The spices, the colors, the noise. It makes the green horns dizzy. Veiled women, camels, and snake charmers. My kind of place. But after repairs, we set back out. Then, about three weeks later, we aided a frigate in a rescue attempt of a big East Indiaman, a 1,900-ton troopship, the Kent. Some damn fool officer dropped a lamp onto a spilled keg of whiskey. The captain ordered the lower deck flooded for fear the fire would touch off the powder magazines amidship. We were able to pull off most of the women and children. Women and children? Aye. Many of the officers were bound for their posts in India and China and had their families aboard. Oh, my God. The two ships took on as many as we could, and that was considerable. Both ships sat low in the water, heavy with evacuees. As we pulled away from the Kent, she listed and started to sink. About 40 sailors clambered up the rigging to escape the flames in the sea. And that's about the time the fire found the magazine. 500 kegs of powder all at once. Boom! Blew a crater in the sea, if you can imagine that. By some miracle, 17 of the sailors on the rigging survived the blast. We found them clinging to the mizzen mast. We were able to save about 500, laddie. But near 100 souls were lost. Horrible. Just horrible. Aye, very sad. Very sad indeed. Sometimes the seas are mighty unforgiving, laddie. But that's a sailor's life now, isn't it? If you say so. I do. Well, I'm off to bed, son. Thanks for listening to an old sailor's tales, laddie. Pleasant dreams. Ship after ship. 
all those people lost, widowed and, and orphaned? Coincidence. Like he said, the seas are unforgiving. There is no such thing as the evil eye. Only fools and heathens entertain such beliefs. Evil eye indeed. Hang the lot of them. midnight, I turned the latch of his door and opened it, oh, so gently. And then, when I had made an opening sufficient for my head, I thrust it in. Asleep. Fast asleep. Am I such a child that an old man's tall tales can give me these terrors? No such thing as the evil eye, I say. Just the the wild imagination of sailors and children. Evil eye. Balderdash. <sighs> Hopkins. I'm off to the paymaster for my wages, boy. Now I'll be able to earn my keep around here instead of imposing on your hospitality. It's no trouble. No trouble at all. After that, I'll make my way to the staghead for a pint or two with my shipmates and give the innkeeper his share. Tonight I'll treat us to a fine feast. That's fine, Hopkins. Fine. Then I'll see you tonight, laddie. Tonight, then. <sighs> Evil eye. It's open. Come in. A Annabelle. I've come for the washing, sir. Oh, the washing. You look afraid, Mr. Perry. What has happened? Happened? Oh, uh, Mr. Hopkins has returned unexpectedly. And I haven't slept well at all the last couple of nights. I wouldn't be able to sleep myself. What do you mean? I mean him. Mr. Hopkins. The evil eye. Oh, come now, Annabelle. You don't mean to tell me you believe in that nonsense, do you? I do. And it isn't nonsense, Mr. Perry. I've heard tell from the old midwife of children born in this very town, mind you, with crooked backs and the feet of gulls because their mothers had the evil eye put on them or they witnessed something bloody or wicked when they were with child. The mothers swaddle the babies in heavy cloth and throw them into the sea rather than have them become evil creatures and go to hell. Creatures like your Mr. Hopkins. That is simply the idle talk of ignorant and superstitious women. Gulls feet indeed. You can't believe that, Annabelle. So it's ignorant and superstitious I am, am I? That's not what I meant. No? What then? Please, Annabelle. Won't you walk along the shore with me this morning? <laughs> I'll not be walking alone with any man who would keep the uh, evil eye under his very roof. I'll not have the wicked thing fall on me. But none of that is true! It's all hogwash, I tell you! Hogwash! Hogwash, is it? Just look at yourself, Mr. Perry. I would swear that the wicked thing has indeed fallen on you. Good day to you, Mr. Perry. Annabelle, please wait. Let me explain. Unhand me, sir. I said good day. Go on then, you stupid peasant. Your ignorance is deadlier than any I. Wait. 
I I'm sorry. What has come over me? The doctor said I was ready to come home. No sleep. <laughs> there it is. No sleep, too much wine, and Hopkins and his damned horror stories. That's all. Oh, I must try to rest. Just a little nap, and I I'll be as right as rain. High winds blew us onto the shoals. The captain kept her afloat best he could, but a gigantic wave came over us and ripped the lifeboats away. We were rescued by some fishermen who were brave enough to row out to us. But she broke up, and of the 116 passengers and crew, only 32 were saved, including myself. 84 souls lost. They found the bodies washing up along the coast for a month. Must have been that I. Come again, lad? Uh, enough to make you cry. Yes, sir. In all my years at sea, I've seen more than my share of bad luck, laddie. That's why I'll be dry docked for a spell. Dry docked? Aye. There are some loose ends that need tying up, and I haven't seen my sister in the country for ages. Uh, you can't take the salt from the sea forever, lad. But there are a couple of things that need tending before I stow my chest in Davy's locker. Besides, you look like it used the company. You haven't touched your food, boy. Aren't you hungry? No. My stomach is a bit upset. Lost my appetite. Oh, now. That's a pity, son, a pity. Well, if you're not going to... Uh, you don't mind if I... Be my guest. <laughs> Thank you, laddie. Ah, delicious. Well, it's been a long day. Think I'll get some shut-eye. Shut-eye, yes. You look tired, Perry. Try and get some sleep. <clears throat> Dry dock. Mm hmm Eighty-four souls lost. How many souls has that vulture's eye seen disappear into the deep? Watching, like a half-blind crow, listening to the wails of panic and despair. Is it superstition, or is it that devil eye like a millstone around the neck of all who catch its cold, dead glance? Get some sleep. Does that hideous eye ever sleep? Does it make poor old Hopkins do its evil bidding, forcing mothers to commit their unfortunate children to the tide? Does the eye sleep? Or does it lie there, watching, looking, staring into the blackness, dreaming of when Hopkins will wake and carry it over the seas and through the wide world? And now, it has lodged itself here, with the old man for its machine. It must be Providence. Yes, Providence. If I have been chosen to look into the pale blue portal of hell, I will save the old man, the world, and myself from the devil's eye forever. His room was as black as pitch with the thick darkness. And so I knew that he could not see the opening of the door. I had my head in and was about to open the lantern when my thumb slipped upon the tin fastening and the old man sprang up in the bed crying out, Who's there? Perry? Damn your eyes! Ah! And so the final hour has struck. <laughs> ah, 
It's all over now, laddie. All over now. And good riddance to that cursed oracle. The night is waning. I must work quickly. The night waned, and I worked hastily, but in silence. First of all, I dismembered the corpse. I cut off the head, and the arms, and the legs. There was nothing to wash out, no stain of any kind, no blood spot whatever. I had been too wary for that. The tub had caught all. <laughs> I then took up three planks from the flooring of the chamber and deposited all between the scantlings. I then replaced the boards so cleverly, so cunningly, that no human eye, not even his, could have detected anything wrong. Four o'clock in the morning. Who could it possibly be? Just a moment, please. Hello. Mr. Perry? Yes? My name is Lieutenant Inspector Williams. May we come in, sir? Yes. Please, do come in, gentlemen. Mr. Perry, this is Inspector Green and Constable O'Reilly. Good morning, gentlemen. What can I do for you? Sorry to disturb you at this hour, sir, but we've had a complaint. A complaint? That's right, sir. A complaint from a neighbor about a noise, sir. A noise? What sort of noise? Frankly, a scream, sir. A man screaming. A man scream? <laughs> oh, of course. Well, you see, gentlemen, this is a trifle embarrassing, I admit. Go on, sir. Well, you see, gentlemen, I had my supper quite late last night, and I'm afraid it had given me indigestion nightmares from which I awoke with a start, but I can't imagine it would have been loud enough to wake anyone but myself. That's why I'm still awake at this hour, a bit of heartburn, that's all. Well, sir, it was loud enough, sir, to send this neighbor to the station house in the wee small hours of the morning to lodge a complaint. Loud enough for the neighbor to suspect foul play. Foul play? An hysteric, I'm sure, Mr. Perry. But we are compelled to look into each complaint lodged. I know you understand. Of course, gentlemen, of course. Well, <laughs> as you can see, I'm, I'm quite alive. Yes, sir. Do you live alone here, sir? Yes. Well... No. That is, I occasionally let a room to a lodger. Sailors, mainly. I see, sir. So there is no one other than yourself residing here presently? There is someone letting a room now, but he isn't home at present. I see. What's the gentleman's name, sir? Uh, Hopkins. Mr. Arnold Hopkins. Mr. Arnold Hopkins. Occupation... Sailor? That's correct. Do you happen to know the present whereabouts of Mr. Hopkins, Mr. Perry? Mm, not exactly. But he had said just this morning how he intended to pay a visit to his sister in the country. And do you know the name of his sister, sir? Ah, uh, I'm afraid I don't, Inspector. He didn't even mention where in the country she lives. I see. Would you mind terribly if we inspect Mr. Hopkins' quarters, Mr. Perry? Not at all, Lieutenant. <laughs> inspect the entire house, if you wish. Thank you, sir. Have you resided here for very long, Mr. Perry? Mm, close to five years now. <laughs> Rather large tub. Yes, I've recently had to dismiss the laundress. Difficult to get good help in this district. Mm, rather. What is the name of your former laundress, sir? Lee. Miss Annabelle Lee. Annabelle Lee? Laundress. Mm -hmm. This is Mr. Hopkins' room, gentlemen. 
as you can see, it's, it's tidy enough. Everything is in its place. His belongings, his money, his bed neatly made. Apparently, he doesn't intend to be away for very long. So it would seem. Please, sit down, gentlemen. Let me get you some chairs. You must be fatigued from following complaints at all hours through the night. Thank you, Mr. Perry. But you know, that's when we are the busiest. Crime is a condition of the night. Most of our more sensational cases are perpetrated after dark. The cloak of darkness. When the world sleeps and all that. I can imagine. Oh, yes. Just as in the case of the uh, Midnight Strangler. Uh, the Midnight Strangler? By day, the murderer was a well-liked employee of a prestigious bank. But during the full moon, he haunted the waterfront taverns for his lady victims. We could never get any evidence or witnesses against the killer. But... One day, he calmly strolled into the station house and, matter-of-factly, gave us all of the details of each of the four murders. A regular Jack the Ripper. Conscience got the better of him, I suppose. <laughs> it was the end of a rope that got the better of him. <laughs> <laughs> well, like the old saying goes, give them enough rope and they'll hang themselves. Quite all right, Mr. Perry. Hmm? What? Oh, yes, quite all right. Uh, the indigestion. Oh, yes. Post-offense behavior gets them every time. Once they've done the deed, they start doing things differently. Avoiding places they would frequent, people they would socialize with, until finally their absence and evasive actions point directly to them. Nonsense. What about all the crimes that go unsolved? Maybe those crimes were a relief to their perpetrators. Maybe for a short while, sir. But eventually they will confide or boast about what they have done, expressing a deep, secret desire to pay for the crimes they have committed. Again, a guilty conscience. Uh, you sound like the doctor. Doctor? And that still leaves out the unsolved. Those sometimes have a way of working themselves out, sir. There was the case of a man who poisoned his sick wife. We knew he had killed her, but again, we lacked sufficient evidence for an arrest. But we knew. We simply made ourselves a presence to him for a couple of months, hoping he would break down. And did he break down? He did, but not to us. He took a nightcap of the same poison he gave his wife, and the case remains officially unsolved. Do you gentlemen hear a noise? No, sir. Nothing but ourselves. Can you describe the noise, sir? Oh, I don't know. A dull thumping. Rats, perhaps? Even as close as we are to the docks, I can assure you, sir, that there are no rats in this house. Then perhaps you have beetles in the walls. What? Beetles? Death Watch beetles, sir. They live, sir, in the walls of old houses like this one. It is said, sir that the little tapping noise they make foretells a death in the house. Preposterous. I think maybe I do hear something. What about you, Lieutenant? You know, Constable, I think for once you're right. <laughs> <laughs> All right! All right! You hear it? You know? Stop making a mockery of me! Stop toying with me, you villains! I admit the deed! Here! Tear up the planks! Here! Here it is! It is the beating of his hideous heart! Ah! Again, thank you for joining us. We hope you have enjoyed the Drama Factory's original adaptation of Edgar Allan Poe's The Telltale Heart. The players are Samantha Pitzer, Olivia Pitzer, Savannah Turnage, Lawrence Raleigh, Dick Winchester, Daniel Knight, Lee Ballesteros, and Douglas Benson. 
The music was Celestial Harmonies and was performed by Roger Woodward on the piano. The Drama Factory would like to thank audio specialists Kay Carter, Frank Sterling, and Miss M, as well as the KPFA First Voice Apprenticeship Program for making this recording possible. Again, thank you for listening, and until next time, good night. Good night.